All right, so in this video, uh, we're going to go over some of the other concepts of equilibrium and also go over KSP. So um, anytime that we do something to a reaction at equilibrium, whatever is done has to be undone. La Chatelier's principle is based around this um, idea. So equilibrium can be disrupted if you change your temperature, if you change the concentration of a reactant or a product. Um, it can also change if you change the volume or pressure. So this is only applying for gases. So remember, if I change the volume and there's a gas involved, that's going to change the pressure as well. So really, it's a, a change in pressure, but volume can impact pressure. So some things that don't impact equilibrium. Catalysts do not impact equilibrium. This is a typical trick that they put on there. Catalysts do not impact equilibrium. It impacts how fast it gets to equilibrium, but it doesn't actually change equilibrium itself. Also, if you add an inert gas, that does not impact equilibrium either. So an inert gas would be like helium, argon, any of the noble gases, because they're not going to react to anything. All right, so. Um, if we change our concentration, if, or if we change our volume, well, if I change the concentration, um, or if I change the volume slash pressure, I will change Q. I'm not changing K, but I change what Q is. And remember, if the reaction um, is where Q does not equal K, the reaction is going to shift until we can get them to equal each other again. So if you add something, um, it has to be taken out. So the reaction is going to shift in the opposite direction. So basically, if I add a reactant, oops. So let's just say I have this reaction right here. A plus B produces C. All right, so if I add something, I'm going to want to get it, get rid of it. So basically, I'm going to go to the opposite side that that thing is on. So if I add A, I need to get rid of A. The only way to get rid of A is to make C. So it's going to shift to the product side. If I remove something, it has to be replaced. So if I remove C, we're going to go back and make more C, and we're going to shift to the product side. Now, if pressure is changed, we're going to look at the number of moles. So let's look at this one again. So if the pressure is increased, then the reaction is going to shift to the side with the least number of molecules. So if I increase pressure here, I would want to go to the side with the least number of molecules, which would be the product side. I have two molecules here, one molecule here. I'm going to get less pressure if I go to this side because then I'll have less collisions. Uh, now, if I decreased the pressure, I would want to basically make more molecules to make more pressure again. So if I decreased it in this reaction, I would go to the reactant side to make more molecules to make more pressure. Now, if they had the same number of molecules, well, changing pressure would do nothing. All right, so let's look at some examples. Uh, here's our reaction. Let's pretend like everything's a, that everything has a coefficient of 1. All right, so what happens if pressure is increased here? All right, so, well, if I look at this particular reaction, I've got one molecule here, one molecule here, one molecule here, uh, but the solid does not get included in my equilibrium constant, so that doesn't actually matter. So if pressure is increased, we're going to go to the side with the least number of molecules, so that would shift to the product side, because the solid doesn't impact your equilibrium. It's not included in the equilibrium expression, so that therefore it it's not going to impact equilibrium. All right, so volume is decreased. Well, I'd want to go backwards to the side with more molecules, so I'd go to the reactant side. All right, so if I add more A, well, I need to get rid of A, so I'm going to go to the opposite side of A, and I'll go to the product side. If I add a catalyst, nothing happens, because catalysts do not impact equilibrium. They only impact how fast the reaction happens. Um, if I remove D, okay, so if I remove D, which is this, well, this is not included in my equilibrium expression, so nothing happens again. It has to be something that is 
in the equilibrium expression. And we do not include solids, we do not include liquids. All right, so if we add helium gas, well, helium gas is inert, so again, nothing happens. All right, so um, now let's look at what happens if we have a change in temperature. So temp temperature is the only thing that changes K. Okay, it doesn't change Q, it changes what K is. So the reaction's going to shift until K is equal to Q again. That's gonna depend on whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic, on which direction it's gonna shift. So what I would do if I were you, I would write down the equation and then include energy as either a product or a reactant. Because remember, if it's a, an endothermic reaction, that means that I have to use energy in the reaction, so it's going to be a reactant. And an exothermic, so an endo, energy would be a reactant. And an exothermic reaction, energy would be a product. So I would write down the expression with energy included in it to decide where it's going to shift. So let's look at this one. Well, delta H is positive, so that means that it's an endothermic reaction. So that means it will be a reactant. So let's see what the question is asking. Oh, five. All right, so in which direction will the reaction shift is if heat is added? All right, so if heat is added here, um, one, well, adding energy. Energy is on the reactant side, so I, if I add something, I need to get rid of it. I'm going to go to the product side. All right, so why? It's because K is no longer equal to Q. K has changed. So K is no longer equal to Q. And remember, if you're answering an FRQ, you have to include Q in your, as part of your answer. All right, so if a substance is added that's not part of the reaction, um, it, pro it may not impact it, but if it can react to a product or a reactant, um, then it removes it from the system. And usually that's how something is actually taken out of a system. They react it to something else. So. An example could be if I add an acid or base to something like this, okay? So I have barium hydroxide and it's decomposing or um, dissolving to make barium and hydroxide. Well, if I add H+, if I add an acid to it, the acid's going to react to that hydroxide. And what happens is it pulls it out of the system. So it makes water and it pulls the hydroxide out that happens, then I'm going to shift to replace that hydroxide. So be careful um, because they might say that they're going to add something to the reaction or the process and if it reacts to something in that reaction then it's removing it. Now when you're answering the FRQs that are asking you um, if the reaction is going to shift to the product side, reactant side, or what happens if you introduce this, you need to talk about Q. Okay, so Q is no longer to K, and you should be specific. So is Q greater than K? Is it less than K? Okay, and then think about it in terms of, well, if this number is too big, because it's no longer equal to K, think about what you have and your expression. Q is equal to products over reactants, just like K. So if Q is too big, that means that this number is too high. I need to get rid of products. Or I can say the bottom number is too small, so I want to shift and go make more reactants. And now if Q is too small, then that means that the products um, are not high enough. So I need to go to the product side. All right, so solubility is KSP. So KSP is our solubility constant. So remember, even though you have some compounds that are insoluble, they all dissolve to a certain extent. So if I dissolve something, I'm gonna break it into its ions. 
So when you write out these expressions, you need to include charges, also include states of matter, and how many you have of each. So if I have two nitrates here, I should have two nitrates on this side. So you need to make sure that everything is balanced, you have your charges, and you have the states of matter. When it dissolves, it should be AQ or aqueous. All right, so, oops. Now, if I'm writing the KSP expression for this particular reaction, well, KSP would be equal to products divided by reactants. So my M2 plus, my metal, and times my anion to the second power, divided by nothing because this is a solid, so we do not include it in the K expression. So if KSP is really, really low, if it's really... Um, if it's a number that's significantly less than one, um, it should be insoluble. But remember, it will dissolve just a tiny bit. So when you're writing out these KSP problems, you should go ahead and draw out your ice table because it's really easy to forget a coefficient somewhere in there. All right, so um, for this particular problem, I want the solubility. So basically, I want the molarity of the K or of the x with a plus 2 in this solution. All right, so first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to write my KSP expression. KSP is equal, well, actually, let's write out our reaction. All right, so it gets dissolved. So it's a solid before it dissolves. Then it'll break apart into ions. Well, x, I don't know what this is, but chlorine has a minus 1 charge, and there's two of those, so I've got to cancel out a negative 2 and I've only got one of these, so this has to be a positive 2. AQ plus my chlorine with a minus 1 charge. And there are two of those, so I need to make sure I have two right there. All right, so now if I write the K expression, products to the first, CL minus to the second. Now, if I want I have the solubility, I'm going to have to plug it into the equation. I have K, so now I'm just going to plug it into this equation right here. So, um, if I do that, though, let's draw out our ice table, because this is what a lot of people will do. This is a mistake that a lot of people will make. They'll forget about this, too. So let's do the ice table. This isn't included, it's a solid. So it should be zero initially. And we're adding products. So plus x, plus 2x here. So at equilibrium, it should be x and 2x. All right, so now I have enough information to go ahead and plug it into this equation. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to plug it into the k expression. So k is 1.7, 7 times 10 to the negative sec. 10th, um, which is equal to x times CL minus. So that's 2x. And this is why I'm telling you, draw out your ice table, because a lot of people will forget about that too. And then squared. And that's the reason I want you to write the k expression, because a lot of people will forget about the squared part. All right, so. Um, Okay, so here's another mistake people make. This whole thing in here is squared. So 2 squared is 4, and then x squared. So it should be 4x cubed is equal to this. All right, so once I go through and solve, I'm going to get x. And my x is going to be equal to 0 0.000. 3, 5, 4. And that's going to be solubility, or we can also say that's the molarity of that metal when this dissolves. And that's when one mole of the substance dissolves. All right, so let's look at something else that you might see for solubility. Okay, so the common ion effect is when you have a salt 
and you're dissolving it, but it becomes less soluble because something is already present. So one of its ions is already present in the solution, so it makes it less soluble. So um, even though chlorides are normally soluble, they're less soluble in seawater because there's already chlorine in that water. So if I were to try to dissolve it and I already have chlorine in that solution, it's going to be less soluble because it's not going to want to um, dissolve fully. So basically, in this case, Q would be greater than K. So if Q is greater than K, I'm going to go shift back to the reactant side and make the solid compound again. Okay, so when a salt contains ions that can actually act as an acid or base, the solubility is going to be affected by pH. So let's look at this case. I have iron hydroxide. Well, if I put it in an acid, well, the acid can react to the hydroxide. So it pulls hydroxide out of the solution, which makes this want to go back and make more hydroxide. So it's going to shift to the product side. So Q is going to be less than K in this case. All right, so let's look at this one. Will calcium carbonate be more soluble in acidic or basic conditions? So if I have this compound and I dissolve it, I'm going to make calcium ions. Notice how I have that, those charges right there. And carbonate ions. So we need to decide, okay, will H plus react to anything in this? Well, let's see. H plus will not react to the positive ion. That won't happen. But H plus can react to carbonate. Since it's so negative, I can react to it to make HCO3, or its conjugate. So it can react to carbonate. So that means that it will be more soluble and acidic. Let's see if it will be soluble in, or more soluble in basic conditions. All right, so basic. Um, if I put hydroxide in here, um, hydroxide's not going to react to this. Calcium hydroxide is soluble. So even if it were to react to that, it just dissolve again. And then right here, Hydroxide will not react to the carbonate because that would be negative, too. So it's going to be more soluble in acidic conditions. So also note, if you have group 1 or group 2, um, if you have one of those ions in there, those rarely will react to anything.